Hey guys, Nicolette here. Today we're talking to Bob Zubricki. He is the manager of 3D printing and prototyping over at TE Connectivity. And he's gonna to talk to us a little bit about how the company implemented the technology over 30 years ago. Um, he'll have some samples of some of the stuff that they've created in the lab. And he has some great advice for those who are implementing the technology into their business. So stay tuned. Hi guys, I'm Nicoletta Mino, and today Brian DeLuca and I are here with Bob Zubricki. He is the manager of 3D printing and prototyping at TE Connectivity, and he's going to talk to us today about all things 3D printing. So, hi Bob, can you tell us a little bit about yourself for those of us who don't know you? Sure, absolutely. I'm a little bit of a unique individual. I can pretty much do anything very diversified, whether it's automotive, uh, building construction, uh, 3D printing, mechanical engineering. So I got a very, very diverse background. Uh, within TE Connectivity, I came to the company 40, year, 40 years ago, and I got involved into the uh, prototyping and model making of connectors. Uh, back then, there was no such thing as a computer. And then around 1987 is when uh, 3D printing came out in 1989. I took a lot of interest in it, got involved into it. So I've been doing 3D printing for about 30 years now. Uh, now, today, I got a big team working for me, a uh, very diverse uh, group of engineers and technicians. Uh, within TE, uh, we do, you know, tens of thousands of prints, you know, per year. So, you know, it's a very skilled, highly skilled type of technology to be involved in. And in today's society, you know, I manage all that. So you've been called uh, the th a 3D printing guru, and which I think is a really cool title. So, I mean, how, how, did, how did you get that? <laughs> well, it's, it's very interesting. And, and that's why I mentioned about being so diverse in the background is that when people call me a 3D printing guru, uh, not only did I start out with 3D printing from the very beginning of its invention, but I've been totally involved, involved in and in, engulfed in it and have a passion about 3D printing through the past 30 years. So, you know, when people want to know anything about 3D printing, they can come and talk to me, whether it's the behind the scenes software connections, the actual 3D printing itself. 3D printing is a very diverse uh, type of a technology out there. And of course, we also call that additive manufacturing. So let's talk a little bit about TE and, and its 3D printing uh, center, which you manage. So the company introduced 3D printing, what was it, over 30 years ago, right? And you've developed some pretty cool prototypes since then. What do you consider to be some of the most groundbreaking that have come out of, out of the center? Well, you know, I'm really glad you're glad you asked that question because I just happen to have with me <laughs> one of the things that we 3D printed. It was a 3D printed <laughs> motorcycle. And we, we did that back in 2000. Can you put that up again, Bob? Can I see that one more time? Sure. That's pretty cool, Bob. How much of that is 3D printed? So it's functional, it's operational. Uh, majority of all the components are on it are 3D printed. Uh, it is an electric motorcycle. We do have it in the Guinness Book of World Records. We do hold approximately seven plus patents on it. So if you want to see more about this, just do you know a web search on 3D printed motorcycle and you'll see TE's a 3D printed motorcycle and the article behind it. That's, that's Wow, that's so, so cool. So that was one. I have another one for you. <laughs> another thing that we did was a 14 foot pearl tower for Shanghai. So this was just given to our facility in Shanghai at our corporate center in 2018 to represent this pearl tower and we've been in China for 30 years in 2018. So we gave it to them as a monumental gift and we built this 14 foot tall pearl tower, which was kind of cool. Wow, so you, I'm assuming that tower, obviously the motorcycle, but the tower you, you printed in components and then assembled them? That's correct, yeah. Yeah. How long does big... the, just out of curiosity, how long did that take? Uh, to do something like that took us about two and a half months. And we did most of that kind of work on our downtime because we have to stay focused. In our, our spare business. time. <laughs> and then, yeah, evenings, weekends, holidays, that's when we'll come in and do something a little bit fun, you know. And, it, you know, it's very rewarding to get your fingers in on things like that. Right. Well, yeah. how long so, are you guys working on the motorcycle, actually? The motorcycle, that took us approximately eight months to do. And that was uh, fully engineered from the ground up. 
and, and build it. Took uh, three different of our machines in order to do that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, countless number of build hours and engineering, but it was a lot of fun. Awesome. <laughs> that is pretty cool. <laughs> But I want to talk a little bit more about this 30 years. So, I mean, 1987, it seems like a pretty early time to start incorporating 3D printing into a business, um, in, at least in this capacity, right? And so GE got in on that. How does that, you know, how, how did that happen for the company and, and how did they start? How has that evolved for, for GE? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that because it's always the inspiration of a lot of times our leaders. And we had management at that time that went to uh, Detroit. They had an Autofact conference. And at this conference, there had this company that was going to roll out this 3D printing technology. And they were looking for companies to get involved in it. And there was no such thing as 3D printing before that. So this individual, uh, his name was Tom Kirstensteiner, worked for our company. And he's seen the vision that this could be a good possibility of helping out a model shop on getting prototypes. So we got involved in the beta testing. We were one of five companies that got involved in beta testing in the very beginning. Uh, we beta tested the technology. We invested in it, got multiple machines in various regions within uh, our company uh, in 2000, uh, or actually 1980. Nine is when I created my department as a service and I seen that uh, this was going to be a definite value for the company moving forward and not just prototyping, but just getting first article pieces in people's hands so they get a good feel of, of what a part looked like. The, prior to that, all you had was computer images or paper images and you really didn't have much of a prototype if, unless you, you know, cut and paste and machine something up, which was very labor intensive. So, so how have you seen it evolve over the last 30 years, right? You know, there's different, you know, there's different additives now that you could use and you have all these different, right, structures. How, how, what have, what have you seen over those 30 years? Like what has changed? Wow. You know, that's a great question to ask somebody like me, because my expectations are so high you know, where 3D printing additive manufacturing is today, I really expected it to be back in the, be at this level back in the mid 1990s. Right. So it was a cultural thing that, you know, from the beginning, we really did not have a good way of implementing it and getting it into our culture until the 2000s when the majority of the public seen this as, you know, a viable source of producing something. And that's when it really took off. So, you know, when you look at 3D printing, 3D printing has a history of peaks and valleys on the successes. Today, if you look at 3D printing, this is just the beginning. You know, we're into a new era. There's a lot of innovation going on. There's a lot of buy-in from corporate America that's taken off with it. It is definitely gonna change the way we produce things in the future, absolutely. So when I think of connectivity, right? I think of key connectivity, its name. I don't think of 3D printing. So how is 3D printing implemented into, you know, connectivity technology and next gen electronics and, and all that fun stuff? Yeah, when you think about 3D printing within connectivity, there's a lot of ways of looking at it, not just the connector itself, but also the encasement that the connections or the wire harness may be in, your packaging of your connectivity, uh, in a lot of ways. So that's going to be basically your low hanging fruit. The thing that the consumer sees is what's going to be the outside packaging before you go inside. You're going to see a lot more functionality happen. You know, it's going to come out of 3D printed parts for connectivity. Uh, if you think about pulling a so uh, your wire uh, outlet, you know, out of the wall and you're going to unplug something, you may have a difficult way of pulling that out because it's molded in a certain manner. It would be nice if that was ergonomic that when you grab onto it, it matches your fingers and you give it a pull and it, it just grabs onto your hand and you don't have to squeeze as much. So things like that is where you're going to see connectivity uh, change, more individualism, more uh, uh, changes within the design and that uh, it's going to be more personalized for the person. I like that. I never thought of that, actually. Um, so heavy question, loaded question. What is some advice that you have 
that you've gained over the course of your experience for those who are kind of just getting into this technology um, in this setting, in a, in a business setting, in a corporate setting, not for the DIYers, but those who are implementing it, you know, what kind of challenges are out there? How do you overcome them? You know, what do you got for them? Again, a very, very good question. And it's one that I run into a lot. And the thing is, when we look at 3D printing additive manufacturing, don't stereotype it. Don't stereotype it on something you've seen that may be a negative. You think 3D printing may be a small printer on your desk at home and it may be take, might take forever to print something. And when you look at the industrial stages of 3D printing, today we can 3D print metal parts, uh, which is just as good as a machine part and just as durable and just as tough. So when we talk about 3D printing in the industrial stage, you know, it's gonna be more expensive. It's gonna be higher buy-in. And if somebody's gonna get started into it, definitely look at your innovation first. Think about your product design. You don't necessarily have to design your product to be manufacturable. You can design your product however you might think of it in your mind. Then you 3D print it, and then you look at your throughput and decide, is this gonna be something that's gonna be a 3D printed type of process? you know, for manufacturability, or are you gonna go into manufacturing to where you're gonna look at throughput and cost reduction in order to, you know, profit what you're gonna do. But I think generally what we need to look at and the advice I give people is, you know, try it, be involved, pay attention to it. It's happening uh, very fast. Uh, the acronyms are all over the place. It's very confusing. But the, the more you're involved, the more you understand, uh, and it's going to change the culture of our manufacturing in the future and everybody should be involved in one way or another or at least knowledgeable. So, so you mentioned uh, designing, right, you know, in there. So how has that also changed with 3D printing over the course of the last 30 years, actually designing your components or designing whatever project it is? How has that changed with the advent of 3D printing? Yeah, great one. And Design is design changes are happening right now today more than I've ever seen in the last 30 years. If you think about a connector and think about how many components may be with a connector, you know, connectors made out up of many components, uh, just like a lot of things in the world are made up of many components that are assembled with 3D printing. You don't have to do that. You can 3D print it as one part and then you eliminate a lot of the assembly process which again will reduce a lot of the cost. And that's why moving into the future, we're gonna see a lot more of this added manufacturing 3D printing type of a process happening. When you look at the actual design of 3D printing, uh, I get a lot of interns that will shadow me, come into the company here and work with me. And it's always great to see young minds that have never touched a machine tool in their life do do designs that normally when you see a design from somebody like that, it's not manufacturable, but to actually produce the part is very you know, engaging. So when we look at design for 3D printing, it's just beginning, the whole new generation is coming up that's gonna change the way we evolve and the way we manufacture it. So there's gonna be a pretty cool things coming in the near future. So it, it seems like you're almost saying it takes away some of the limitations that were previously. I was just going to add, you just took the words right out of them. I was going to say, so the advice is really don't limit yourself then because you don't have to work backwards anymore. Now you can actually work forwards. You know, no, you're not limited. Yep. You read my mind. Yeah. Wow. For sure. So what else, Bob? What else should, should, you know, if we're talking to, let's say, engineers, if we're talking to businesses, um, recently, we, um, we published an article on e-design it about, um, you know, the truth about 3D printing in a business setting. And, you know, some companies think they want to implement it, but, you know, they don't, they're not realistic. They don't have the, you know, for example, the designers on staff, they have to work, you know, different things that come up. So, you know, if you had to, to speak to these people, what else, what else should they think about? You know, what else are we missing? Yeah, I think the main thing that people really need to look at, especially if you're looking at, you know, the industrial age and the commercial age out there, you really look at the material materials themselves that are coming off of these 3D printers, and they're not exactly where they need to be today, but they're getting closer. And if you think you're going to go out and get a 3D printer and start producing things immediately, 
we may, may not be there 100% yet, but it's getting there. So you really need to do your research on the materials and what your engineering needs are of that 3D printed part before you make that step. And before you make the investment, and you're gonna do an investment at a large scale, and sometimes it's very hard to justify the payback on some of these large end uh, you know, corporate type uh, 3D industrial 3D printers, uh, go to the service bureau. There's a lot of service bureaus out there that'll run parts for you, uh, get the parts, look at them, uh, analyze them, break them, see what's really gonna work for you, and ask a lot of questions about the technology and the materials and once you find something that fits, that works with for you, focus on that technology and really research that technology. Because if you took one particular type of a technology within 3D printing, there's a, there's, there's a, a ton of different manufacturers out there. And you really want to see what the manufacturers have to offer for whatever you would like to produce. Are they really that different? I mean, when you're looking at all the manufacturers, is it just cost? Is it efficiency? What are, I mean, what are the variations there when you're looking at so many manufacturers? Yeah, a lot of the variations can fall just in materials. Uh, some manufacturers of 3D printing, you have to buy all the materials from them. Uh, other materials, uh, 3D printers, they're totally open architecture. So you can uh, pretty much use any material you find, you know, anywhere that's being sold in the world. So you really got to find, you know, what material works for you. And if the, if the part itself does not have a good quality look to it, you got to find out why. Why is the quality not there? You know, is it the resolution? Is it the, you know, the recipe or the parameter sets they use, they use to run the machine? Or is it the individual? You know, sometimes, you know, a person can either make or break a technology. So when you get a, we'll call it a bad looking or bad functioning 3D printed part, uh, just try again, look around and see what else is available, you know, in order to, you know, get what your needs are. And that's what you've been doing for the past 30 years, right? So obviously it works. <laughs> yeah, it's working. absolutely. Yeah. Well, it seems like you guys are doing some really, really cool things over there. And if you print any more bikes, please send us some photos. <laughs> we, would, we would love to see what that process looks like. Send us a, send us a motorcycle, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but... We wanted to thank you for taking some time to talk to us about TE and, and the um, prototyping lab and talk to us about 3D printing and um, we just really appreciate the time. Yeah, absolutely. You're doing some amazing work over there. Yes. And if anybody wants any more information, you can go to te.com. Uh, there's a wealth of information about our connectors connectivity and you can find even articles on a 3D printed motorcycle there. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Bob. Bob.